I've turned it off anyway, so if it's muted, does it matter? No, yeah, it's still done for. Ah. Which we'll get rid of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. Okay, is everyone ready to roll? I shall declare our, um, our ICM meeting open. Uh, welcome everyone to our, our little team. Yeah, I'm glad you guys turned up. So 10 to 10, I didn't think I was going to have a quorum. <laughs> okay, um, so look, um, first um, item is confirmation of the agenda. I haven't heard anything to the contrary, so I'll move that the agenda is presented be confirmed. Stu Husband's going to second that. All those in favour, say aye, carried. Are there um, number three, are there any disclosures of interest that haven't already been disclosed? No, so it's a no for that one, um, James. So we'll go to um, number four, which is um, issues and actions um, from the previous ICM meeting. And just in terms of online, I think Pamela's, um, welcome Pamela, see you there. Pamela's the only other member who's who's online here. Um, okay, I'll hand over to Mr. Chair, could, could you just tell me who's in chambers? Oh, so we've got um, Kathy White, Stu Husband, myself, Andrew Mack, and Dennis Teague. And then we've got Fred sitting at the back of the room. Um, and do you want a staff list as well, or you're all good? No, no, I just wanted oh, to actually, understand um, who, who was yeah, on the Greg will, Cheers. Greg will introduce the various staff as, as, as they come up here. Got it. So I'll, um, and we've got Matthew Dean at the back of the room too, observing as well, Pamela, yeah. <clears throat> Is it your intention to um, take commentary from Councillor Litchwark? Um, yeah, yep, good, yep, thank you. You want to be good, aren't you, Fred? I don't know. Okay. I do appreciate Um, okay, so Greg, I'll hand over to you. We'll get into issues and actions on number four. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, just before I get into the paper, I'd just um, like to introduce staff that are um, in the room and online as well. So we've got Patrick Whaley, our manager of biosecurity and biodiversity, uh, Kelly Stokes, manager of business and technical services, and Adam Munro, manager of flood protection and land drainage. So you'll see um, uh, those those people throughout today. Um, we also have several people online. So we've got Jody Olson, who's our zone manager, uh, Waiho and Piako. So she'll be joining us particularly for the um, catchment river and flood uh, items. Uh, we've got Paula Reeves, who will be um, presenting information on our Billion Trees program later on today. Uh, Sandra Balkum, which um, some of you may not have met yet, but she is our new ICM principal advisor. Um, so she is in listening today and um, uh, getting to know the committee. Uh, we've got Sarah Leland, who is our zone manager, Lower Waikato, um, who will, like Jody, um, particularly be involved in those catchment river and flood um, papers. Um, and also my EA Stefania um, is there as well to coordinate our bod. So you see in the um, in the agenda that we will have staff coming in and out today and I'll introduce them as we um, as we get through. So I think that's everyone I can see online. Uh, and we may also have, I think Itty as well has joined us. Itty is our um, Taupo Upper Waikato um, Zone Manager. So she'll be joining us for the catchment and river management work as well. So turning to item uh, four, which is our issues and actions paper. So uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll take that as read. Um, one thing I will say is that um, several of the in progress um, uh, actions there, I'll just note the dates on the updates there. Um, and that was um, uh, not so much that the items haven't been updated, but more so that those items haven't been progressed. So just running through a couple of them there, um, the self-administration work with um, uh, Trevor Simpson. So that is still underway. There's been some logistical challenges with the COVID environment and getting that um, self-administration group underway. Um, but we have also engaged a consultant to develop a policy for um, council in terms of considering um, changes in self-administration arrangements, which was an action from council when we agreed to that. 
moving through, obviously, the, the Carfia um, beach access issue is still one that we're working with that community on, um, and Otrawanga District Council are leading that particular um, job because it's to do with bylaws um, and how to I guess, enable the communities after. Um, and the double tap trial there, just noting that the staff that were um, going to be working on that um, particular item to prepare the information um, were uh, reprioritised to get the RPMP um, to where it's got to, so we'll expect that update um, at a later meeting. Uh, running through some of the other ones that are still in progress, uh, so we have one around scheme defects and that is an ongoing action. Um, it's a regular discussion point at our subcommittees and just providing visibility of what those scheme land defects look like and how we're um, managing them. And the last one there around uh, koi, I just note that there is a, quite a substantial paper today on um, pest fish um, and uh, we'll talk about some um, appropriate actions from here on, particularly to engage those subcommittees, which I know have a keen interest in pest fish in particular on koi management. Uh, and the last one there is just around uh, meeting some former um, catchment committee members and particularly the landowner um, appointees to Taipo up Wake that are on West Coast. Uh, suited for Christmas. So I um, interrupted them unfortunately, so they are scheduled for the end of May. Uh, we're still going ahead, so I know those are highly valued by these members um, around the table. <laughs> so, uh, have to take the rest as, as read, Mr. Chairman, for those uh, updates and uh, Okay, so Max is going to move. Dennis is happy to second. Now, before I put it, any questions? Yeah, Kathy. Yeah, so just a um, question on so page seven um, to do with the Waikato Regional Pest Management Plan annual report and operational plan. Um, so it's got there that um, non-target deaths where council or its contractors have been found to be non-compliant with a permission or regulation during the reporting period. Um, so are we still going to be told if there are animal deaths? Yeah, so uh, I guess there's two different um, communication lines, I suppose. Um, what those actions are talking about, the formal reporting lines through ICMC. Um, but we'll, what we also have across that, and it's not just related to this particular matter, it's across you know, any matter to do with our work programs, is if, if things do emerge in the community, um, then it's uh, then then we, we will be forthcoming in terms of advising councillors where things have emerged in the community, um, just for awareness. Um, but we need to be care very careful with that because often we, we will do that very early in the process. It'll be um, before investigations are undertaken, so it's very much an awareness exercise. Um, we need to make sure we protect the privacy and confidentiality of that information. Um, and, and I guess uh, you will need to have the assurance that I'll make sure that the right actions are taken in response to those matters that come up. Yeah. Okay. So that's basically reaffirming what, what we what we do already. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah no, thanks, Mr Chair. Um, we, yesterday we talked about the coastal plan and um, we talked about going out to um, stakeholders. It would be really good to get that in front of the committee members. You know, just just a run through of it of, of what it looks like because it's just more people to hide behind out there that if it goes wrong we can say well hey where do you guys it's your should have kathy's just talking about no no, no the coastal plan. oh okay sorry yeah, yeah just yeah, when yeah. we go out to just just put it on actions just for staff to just 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 not not to yeah. debate it not, yeah. not to give a submission just to see it yep cool. yeah we'll take that <laughs> Yep, I'll be. Uh, the only thing I was going to say is um, certainly it, it's of <laughs> certainly it's of interest to the Hodaki area because of the proximity to the coastal marine area. Um, uh, if these guys are oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We'll take that action. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll put that then. All as a favour. Sorry, mate. Um, the Kathy's point. When we first discussed this, I remember the choice of language that I use specifically in relation to reporting unintended consequences. Um, and my specific request was that the chief executive be made aware. I think it's really important for you personally to make sure that the man above you, who is our only employee, knows exactly the situation with 
um, is associated with the use of toxins uh, that were unintended. I retain the right to go and see him and have a talk to him. Not saying that that has to be a formal you thou, thou shalt write a report, but, but I do want someone above you, and there's only one person above you, to um, know what's going on. So if in answering that question, um, we're still going to get an outcome where the chief executive of the organisation has a sense of what's going on in terms of vector con um, possum control, uh, especially um, pest control and unintended consequences. And I'm, I think that's a great outcome. Thank you. Thanks. And okay. that absolutely is the case. So if, the case. If, if, if I am uh, advising members around any, any matters that have arisen, that Chris is part of that um, communication as well. Okay, so I'll put that we received the report all in favour, please. Say aye. Mr. Kerry. Hey, Dennis, um, can you put your light just by your left hand? Because I just blasted the screen here. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, thanks. And I'll hopefully see it. Cool. Okay, so um, advice, number five now, advisory subcommittee meeting minutes. So, Stu, you're going to take us through those. And I see there's one section B item around that insurance thing. Yeah, yeah. So there's, a, there's a section B in there you'll see council um, from way up the arco. Um, we believe that we're paying far too much for insurance um, on the bill, so we'd like to and, and some of that insurance. So, Look at the option. I'll do it. Look at the option. Well, be it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see when we've made the last claim on a stop bank. So, and you, you're paying thousands and thousands and thousands every year to insure it. So they're saying self insure it. So it's just, no, hold on. It's not a debate. It's not a debate. It's just saying, can we look at it? That's it. Can council just have a look at it? If it's a no and and thing, no, it is. They're happy with that. But they're just saying it's probably something to look at. So I I I I'm inclined to go your way of thinking. Um, some people around this table shelf insure. Um, but if I lose the cow shed tomorrow, I don't have a million dollars to put it back up. So um, I guess and so we just got to. I just they're just requesting council staff. Okay. Have a look at it at, at what it would involve and, and think so as you can see in the um in the papers i'm going to take them all mr chair do the whole lot wrap them all up as one okay. so you can see the um in the papers the um self-administration conversations have been happening of drainage areas um and um trevor simpson has his um, self-administered drain out there now um yeah, but other than that, it was just really these meetings are just for information. So these these committees have no mandate to put anything up to us. So they're just it's really just information. So um, but um, we did. I'm not sure where it would be appropriate, Mr. Chair. And I'm taking your leave if if it's not appropriate, you can say. But it would be really kind of nice if I don't know where you do this in the meeting. But if Matthew would be able to show this committee what he's invented and what council are working with him on. So when do you think that would be appropriate to because that was part of the lower Waikato catchment? So either lunchtime or if he's if he's if he's um not here all day, or if he's here all day at the end or at lunchtime, how's that sound? Yeah, okay. Cool. So would you stay for lunch yeah. with us, Matthew? Good. Okay. But um yeah, I'm happy to wrap the whole lot up. If there's any questions on particular points that you've read. So Stu's going to move, um, seconded by Mac. Um, I'll just get Greg to make some commentary yeah. on the insurance thing and then Dennis for a question. Yeah, I'll just note, um, so the recommendation is around this committee undertaking a review of those insurances, yeah, um, which falls outside the scope of the business of this committee. But what I would say is I think it's appropriate for this committee to receive that um, recommendation, um, but that staff then take, away that as, take that away as an action um, to follow up with the relevant parts of the organisation, particularly finance and business services. And um, staff are already having those discussions and 
doing some investigation into um, what happens and what are some examples of insurance claims have been in the past. So I'll just have Dennis the light. Dennis. Yeah, look, I, I'd support a review which committee it is in the organisation, not so worried about. But one of the things I think I've raised previously um, with Greg in another forum was the issue of whether insurance companies will start to withdraw cover when, you know, as um, sea level rise or flood events occur. So, you know, I think that's another good reason to have the review because um, we, we hear a lot about insurance review for houses and so on, and that's, that's a sort of known thing, but maybe stop paying some more more robust than some houses, but um, you know I think it's important that we keep an eye on that. that Dennis, you're right, Matt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I, yeah, I, do, I do think in taking that recommendation, you, you need to listen to what Councillor Husband said about his personal position on this. I, I, I think that's quite telling between what's here and what he said, uh, and I'm I, I think what I'm hearing him say is. He's, he's got a degree of realism about what self-insurance might look like. And I mean, the thing about self-insurance that would frighten me, um, if you had an Edgecombe type event, we're in deep trouble, deep trouble. And you've always said to us, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of economic activity behind those stock banks. You, you would only want to have one failure. And the money you've saved on insurance policies over the years would be infinitesimal compared to the harm. That, that's why I, my reaction of nervousness, really, unless I've misunderstood. Yeah, no, no, and and I'm I'm sort of on your same page. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't take that risk as a, uh, in my business where Russ can, he's freehold, but yeah, you know, so he self insures. But but I, I I can't, and I think that's where the schemes are. You know, I, I I don't think I would put that weight on the thing, but I think it's well worth um, just having the review. Yeah, you know, just having to see what comes out of it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'll put that those all those four minutes um, moved by Stu, seconded by Mac. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carrying that includes the section B. Um, so we'll now go to um, page six, which item six, page twenty nine, which is a biosecurity and biodiversity um, update. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is the first of our general activity updates. I'm just noting that how we've structured the agenda today is we have activity updates for biosecurity biodiversity, catchment of river, and also flood. But then there are some bespoke papers that follow those general updates um, to get into. So, so we'll have uh, yes, welcome to Patrick um, to take us through this general activity update before we dive into some of those bespoke papers. Morning, Patrick. Uh, morning, councillors. Um, what to do? Um, hey, look. Because we've got the papers, I've got three different papers on the agenda. I, I was going to just uh, request that we take the status report as read. Pull your map, mic a bit closer. Yeah. Sorry, um, sorry. Um, just request that the um, status report is essentially okay. taken as read, given yep. we've got the other three papers on the agenda. Okay, cool. So, Joe's going to move. Max going to second. Some questions. Yep. I'll second them. Yep. <clears throat> Audio. Um, Max. Um, so. Um, can I just be really clear that I understand what you're saying in item 8A? You say 1.306960 <coughs> for wild and pine control, a proportion of this was carried over into the 21-22 financial year. That, that's right? Yep. How much? Four park. There was a... a Few hundred thousand dollars. Hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay. Have you got an ETF, ETF um, estimate to finish? When you look at that pie chart, the uh, sorry, the um, bar graph. Have you got an estimate to finish in terms of how likely you are to meet your um, expenditure? In other words, will there be enough? Have you got a sufficient burn rate to get to your target? So, so that's that's covered down below in the um, shovel ready. Program, so it's 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 green. So yes, we have. And through you, Mr. Chair, so we'll put our key project reference for it next week. Provide uh, some more figures around that four thousand, which is on track. Financial year. Good, Mac. Is your lights? Yeah, cool. Uh, Kathy. 
Um, yeah, just, just two questions, um, Patrick. One of them is um, the number 43, page 37. Just wanted to ask you, um, so 1080 has never been used in the Kaimais, and you're talking there about um, um, basically, you know, the project which is going on there, the Kaimai Mamaku Ranges Forest Restoration Project, and that it's a collaborative project between a lot of councils, Doc, Iwi, Hapu, et cetera. At the moment, 1080 is just being used on the Mamaku Plateau, but as part of this project, are they intending to use 1080 in the Kaimais? At, at this stage, I don't think there's a plan for it. I, I, I'm not sure it's on, I'm sure they're discussing it, but um, that, that would be up to the trust. Um, I'm, I, I believe soon that the um, trust is going to take on the responsibility for managing the forest, the, the biodiversity in the forest. Um, it'll be up to the trust. So who is it? Who exactly is the trust? Um, so it's a, a hapu, hapu running, hapu uh, have formed a trust that uh, will be administrating, administering the $19 million for the community. We, we're a supporting agency, we're not in the trust itself. And just one other question, if that's yep. okay. Um, page 32, number 18, um, the operation, the Pukikawa PPCA operation in the North Waikato. What ended up happening about the dead cow after the, what happened? Did we do tests? Did we do tests for toxins in the dead cow? Uh, I understand the landowner didn't do it. The landowner didn't test? It was too late by the time, um, because it was during the level four lockdown. Uh, it was very tricky for anything to happen in that area, and um, they didn't end up doing tests. So do we actually require tests in that situation? Because it is, I presume it's, it's, a, it's an outcome of our operation. It, it's up to the landowner to prove that something happened or not, that it, of how it died. I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I just really would like to dig into this a little bit more and I, I would like some feedback on this because there are animal welfare um, issues around it as well. It's not just about compliance within our pest control operation. There are MPI requirements around reporting of um, of issues to do with animals, um, especially cattle, anything that's in a food production, um, uh, you know, arrangement that, that that they need to actually report if there's been contamination of a cattle beast or a or a dairy cow. So I'd just like to know what are our requirements around them actually testing for toxin if we don't do it ourselves. Well, I suppose it's no different to. If I put bait out at home in my bait stations and a, and a cattle dies, I mean, it's up to me. If, 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 no, no. Well, this was a PPCA operation, yeah, though. But, but this my was our operation. My understanding is that, that we did an investigation and there was found to be no fault on, on our part. Uh, sorry, Greg, can you add a bit more? Or, in, in which case, it's not our... Moves away from us. Is that yeah, yeah. So through you, Mr. Chairman, this was a ground-based operation. It wasn't an aerial um, operation. Um, so we we did our own inquiries to establish um, whether we had done what we should have done um, in terms of that ground-based operation, and did confirm that we had. Um, the EPA were also involved, and we confirmed in uh, paragraph 18 that they have found that there was nothing um, that we shouldn't have done. Um, so, and so, no, not, hang on, no, and so um, in terms of our responsibility to understand what happened there, it is in relation to our operation and whether we did what we should have. Um, my concern is that, um, you know, those are possibly issues, um, but whether or not those issues are actually matter for this committee, um, I, I suspect not. I do feel that, um, that there's an, a responsibility on our part to make sure that whatever happens in our pest control operations, you know, in terms of the communication with the landowner or 
or making sure that gates or fences or whatever are robust, um, that, that there isn't the possibility of um, these kinds of unintended consequences. Um, but I also feel that we also should have a, um, an agreement with a landowner that, um, that if there is something like this happens, that they actually should get their animals tested to see whether it was the toxin, which toxin killed them. Um, because for us, it's, I think, it's a risk question. Um, we need to know when animals die in our pest control operations. We need to understand that there are risks there and what do we need to do to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, and um, so, as I said, my understanding is that we have did everything that we needed to. Um, I believe in this particular situation, it simply wasn't possible to take those steps because of the particular circumstances around the steep. Um, the time that had elapsed. Just noting, yeah. The comments around the level four that we're in. Um, there was also time that had elapsed before we became aware of the situation as well. So the professional advice we had was around um, whether or not it would be appropriate to undertake in the cost, for example. That's what, that's the um, I'm just waiting for a question. Yes, is it related to the point? Uh, no, it's related to the point. Sure. I, I think Cathy was asking a different question. Uh, Cathy was saying, if there is a risk of sublethal intoxications and um, intoxicants entering the food chain, do we have any responsibility to that? Which is, which is uh, not the question you answered. The question you answered was, we've got a PPCA program. We did everything that we're supposed to do, um, given that there was a dead animal. But, but I think the question that's been asked is around um, food safety. And it's a fair question, actually. Um, because there will be, I don't know what the LD50 are used to of 1080s, but there'll be a sudden dose of 1080, which you wouldn't probably want in the food chain. And I think that's the question that's been asked here, or double tap or whatever else it may be. Now, I don't know that we would have any obligations under um, food security um, bylaws or to MPI. But if we were in a position where we, and, and I have been in this position actually, where a herd of Herefords on an airstrip broke through a fence, uh, three of them died with 1080. But the question in my mind is, what about the other 15 that were in the mob that were pretty excitable, that were in the food chain? And um, nothing happened about them, that, you know, they metabolised it and went on to have their calves, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I think it's a reasonable question. Um, I suspect the answer will be not our bailiwick, but it's not an unreasonable. Yeah. Of course, at the end of the day, I'm the one, the farmer is the one that loads the animals onto the truck to go to the food processing plant. I, I, I'm the one that signs a declaration on the AS, ASD form, Animal Status Declaration. Um, the regional council doesn't sign that ASD declaration, you know, so, so that's the onus on me. But I do, I do think, though, that it's sort of the onus is on us to actually say to the, the landowner that this is a requirement, a food safety requirement. The thing is, if it was Bridificum that was in that bait station, there's actually a requirement that you're not supposed to commercially harvest food from that area for three years if there's contamination. That's a food safety requirement. So if it was Bridificum that was in that bait station and, and cattle got access to it, um, then they should have actually tested it. That was a food safety breach, I think, if they didn't actually do it. And when you said that, um, that you know, it wasn't possible to do an autopsy, I'm doubtful about that, actually, because the vets that I know were working, they were essential services. They were actually working throughout lockdown. Um, and I know that because I actually went to a vet to get you know, Sorry. access Sorry, to Sorry, Cathy, that's not what I said. Um, look, the person didn't even notice. Okay. The, the person didn't notice. A very, very loose farm. They didn't know. Okay. They didn't know the cow had died. I mean, this, this, I've got an, this is very, very, very operational. Um, I've got a lot more information. But look, the person didn't notice. And when they did, it was complex because it was locked down. We couldn't get any staff there. It was it was a complex situation. So absolutely, all those things. That is exactly what our contractors and staff do with every landowner. This is part of the bread and butter of what we do. We talk through all those risks. 
to, with every landowner, every one of the 5,000 landowners we work with. That's how we work. So, the, every, and, and everyone knows, you know, but this is a landowner who didn't even notice until it was weeks into it. Really yeah, tricky situation. Might be doing an autopsy yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, Okay, mm. so look, I think we've had a pretty robust response, Cathy. I appreciate you don't agree, but... Yeah. Having said that, though, Bridificum is a persistent thing. You still could get a result three weeks later. Anyway, I think I just I just don't think that we're doing enough in this issue. Except I'm not quite sure how that cow's going to get to the deep cow's going to get to the bird chart. Well, no, not that one, but I'm saying if there were others that actually accessed that bait station, we don't know. <laughs> but if we found out that it was Bridificum that was in that dead cow, then probably, you know, look, if okay. there are no other dead cows, it possibly means it's okay, but Bridificum is an accumulating toxin. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Thanks. Just some four, sort of four quick points. There was some really good publicity uh, recently around the Wilding Pine program in the local media, and um, I just wondered with the Kauri project, you know, a million dollars going in there, whether it would be possible without revealing, you know, the sensitivity of where these areas are. Just to have some, some sort of, um, you know, brief outline, a few half a page or something, that could, you know, report back to the community on how that program's going. So that's point number one. Um, just how dangerous is the shrimp that's been found in the Whitiang waterways? It's said to be not classed as a, um, you know, dangerous organism. But how, how concerned should we be about that? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know if they know. I think there's a little bit of monitoring going on um, with regards to the mantis shrimp. Um, not that we can do much about it, but they are getting predated on by native species. So I, I don't know, but they are doing a little bit of monitoring around what, what, what the impacts will be. They're pretty. They're a pretty impressive um, predator if you've seen them on the um, you know National Geographic channel. There, they're pretty impressive predators. Um, third one was that um, I know Wallaby was located in, in the Coromandel. Any update on whether that's been located? No, we haven't got any update on that. But presumably still out there somewhere. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And the, the fourth one was, um, was some commentary around June planting, and and I see from later in other reports we have statistics on the survival rate of plants planted on land about maybe you know as high as 86 percent i'm just wondering whether whether we do review those dune plantings because there's been some major erosion particularly on the east coast of the coromandel and you know these plants get wiped out so is there some way we can monitor how well we're spending that money because you know if they're not surviving something we need to look at and review uh i mean we can come back to the committee on that i know my team have been looking at the survivor rate of of the plantings on both coasts so i can come back to the committee on that thank you thanks did you have a question no. okay no, I just can't. Oh, sorry michael i get in trouble with him <laughs> oh, hang on hang on Stu. we need a red light when we undertake these work programs, it might be just a timely reminder to remind councillors what process we actually do go through before we're allowed to do any of these things on people's farms. Because I think the farmers front and centre, and aren't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Relation, <laughs> relationships are everything, and um, yeah, without them, we have nothing. Yeah. Thanks, You got a question, Fred? Yeah, um, it's in relation to Stu and Cathy, in that, yeah, human, you know, getting this toxin into the food chain, um, it's the animal food chain that I'm concerned about, as in dog rolls, you know, posse yum yum. Um, my dog, you know, ended up in the vet um, due to an unexplained seizure after eating that that and uh, was very sick, took a long time to recover. And I'm just concerned about when you hear the mamaku kaimais, uh, potentially a poison operation, that 
the people that harvest possums in particular and, you know, um, dead cows that go into the food chain, animal food chain, that it doesn't happen and that there are precautions out there to make sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. Yeah, no, fair point. Incidentally, Cathy, um, I can't remember if you're on the council when Norm Barker was on with us. Did you know Norm Barker? Yeah, well, Norm's heavily involved in that Kaimo Mamaku project, so he's probably a good point of call there. Okay, um, so we're all done for this one now, aren't we? Because I think, am I correct? No more questions. So I'll move. Stu's happy to second. Oh, did we? Okay. Okay, so I'll put that all in favour. Please say aye. Against. Carried. Um, the Natural Heritage Partnership Program funding round, so page 38. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and we're joined by Judy Van Rossen online um, to um, help with this report as well. Um, just a brief report just about um, how we propose to navigate a couple of live applications that we're expecting to come in for the Natural Heritage Fund. Um, and it's a paper that picks up on, um, I guess, some comments that have been around this committee table previously around needing to really take a holistic look at how we deal with these applications when making decisions. So I'll pass over to Patrick and Judy to um, do this. Yeah, thanks, Greg and Chair. Um, so, I mean, Judy's online for questions, um, but I mean, we, we can take it as read. I think we um, have now five. One of the applicants pulled out yesterday, so I think we now have five potential um, natural heritage fund applications to work through. But still, I you know doesn't change that it probably needs to go through to full council. I think that's it. I'd, okay. Yeah. Stu? Yeah, no, I just um, completely agree, Patrick. Um, and it'll be good to see it go through to full council chair. I'd hate to double up on the debate. So I'm hoping we can just skip through this. If it's going to go to full council, we'll have the debate up there. Thank yep. you. Yeah, uh, and look, I mean, the it, debate has, questions up there. it has to go because we'll preempt the, um, the, the thing otherwise. So, look, you're happy to move the recommendation? Yeah. Um, Max, happy to second? Yeah. Yep. And you're a comment, Max? Um, are we allowed to ask questions about um, the uh, comments on page 39? Yep. Um, Kiara Hikoi Trust, is that the um, Tango group? In Te Ho. Yeah. Tiara Hikoi Trust, uh, 11F. It's not Tiara Ho, is it? No. So they they, uh, they straddle uh, the Auckland Waikato regional boundary. Right. It's just chair. Oh, there, Tiara Ho. Let me, let me ask the question a different way then. Um, I had one of the Hiratonga uh, members approach me when I was at Coromandel a couple of weeks ago. You and I have talked about this, eh? Oh, yeah, I do remember yeah, you telling yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eugene. Sorry? Eugene. The, Eugene. Big, the big fella. I just forget his oh, name. Quentin. Quinton, sorry. Oh, you told me. I, I wasn't Quinton. contrary to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, if, if the wheels fall off one of these projects in terms of the people who go into the project at the start and they go along holding hands until one day they no longer hold hands and they have a parting of the ways, what comfort can we take as governors that they are still able to deliver fully on the promise? Uh, yeah, so we, we work closely with all of these groups um, and um, we, we were aware that there was some issues with one of the people involved. Um, he's since gone his own way, um, and the, but the, the project is still intact. Uh, they're, they're meeting all their milestones and uh, yeah, on track to deliver work. So we, we monitor that and keep, you know, we're talking with them all the time. So. So we're just as interested in you know, making sure that they're on track. Thanks, Patrick. That's a good answer. Thank you. Dennis. I just wondered, um, there's some commentary around the spread of funding you know, around the region. Um, is, is sort of geographical location one of the criteria under the terms of reference? Because, you know, it, in, in my mind, it's, it's all about merit. Um, you know, does this, does this application merit funding rather than where it's located? Um, and I just see there's some commentary in there around that, and I just 
want to be sure we're actually complying with our terms of reference. I mean, I don't, I don't believe so, but I think Judy's probably best place to answer that. Um, yes, thank you, um, Chair and Councillors. So um, it is not a criteria as such to have um, a spread of applications. It's just a consideration when we um, are talking to applicants in advance of them putting an application in. Um, that comment in the agenda paper is really in response to some discussion that was held at the uh, council meeting. So um, and I think that was it in February when the new chums application was discussed and there was a comment around, you know, a lot of applications coming from the Coromandel. So it's not a criteria, it's just a comment really um, that we've put in the paper that we are, in this uh, instance, we have got other applications from other parts of the region. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt. Um, Patrick, uh, in relation to item 18, would you and Judy think there was any value in us having a look at the TOR? Uh, I, I believe there will be a process that um, councils will be involved in it. Um, whether the, I'm assuming the terms of reference is probably going to come past council at some stage. Mm -hmm. No, what do you think? What I, do you personally think? Um, yeah, I think so because I think we we kind of covered a lot of this with the community restoration committee. I think we were heading down the route of we put the framework, we got the framework in place. That was a good bit of work. The next thing would have been looking then at our role in the in the natural heritage program and the criteria. So, yes, probably. Yeah. Do you see a TOR, Fred? We hadn't got that far. Okay. I think so the existing TOR must be available. It's public. Well, oh, you mean the criteria for the fund? Yeah, yeah it's all on the website. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah the terms of reference for the review. It's the terms of reference for the review. Oh, the review. Well, yeah, it's yeah. probably in development. Is it? Yeah. yeah, look, I, I'd be good for us to have a look at it. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, Stu and Mac have moved that. Oh, all those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Um, Radio uh, Shallow Lakes Program Overview 42. Yes, yeah, so I'd like 42. to welcome Natasha Granger to the meeting. So Natasha is our uh, Lakes Advisor and um, she's been heavily involved in this project, which um, felt it was a good time to bring to this committee for a couple of reasons. One, it's been very topical in, in parts of the region with the extended dry period that we've had. Um, Shallow Lakes are an important feature of our region. Um, and the other one was um, this program actually received um, some reprioritised funding as part of the last long term plan. Um, so it'd be appropriate to give you an update on where we were going with that. So I'll pass over to Patrick and Natasha. Tina Koto Katoa, Ko Natasha Granger, Aho. Uh, he Kai Fakahari o Naroto, uh, Me Te Ripu, Aho. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Natasha Granger. Um, I am the Lakes and Wetlands Management Officer here at the Council. Um, here to, is um, Greg C to give you an overview of the Shallow Lakes program. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, I'm going to start with just a little bit of a background about the program. Um, the program for Shallow Lakes is derived from treaty settlements, the regional policy statement, regional plans, um, and non-statutory agreements such as the Waikato Peat Lakes and Wetlands Accord and the Waikato District uh, Memorandum of Agreement. Um, I just want to make the point that while we work collaboratively with other agencies, Tangata Whenua and Iwi, uh, the objectives of each agency are not always aligned, and that restoration activities often focus a lot on outputs rather than outcomes. And so what I mean by that is it's quite easy to build a fence or plant some plants, but it's not always, um, uh, we're not always able to achieve an outcome, i.e. improve water quality around lakes. Uh, next slide, why do we care about lakes? They're culturally uh, significant, they're really important for recreation, um, they provide habitat for native species. Uh, we have commercial, traditional, recreational fisheries associated with them. They're really important for ecosystem processes, providing connectivity between our rivers, our lakes and our wetlands. Uh, and they do have some economic benefits, obviously they provide water uh, for, for um, drinking and stock, uh, as well as flood control protection. And of course, they're just beautiful places to be enjoyed by people. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, Waikato region is blessed with many lakes. Um, we have five main types, and just to quickly go through them, the riverine lakes dominated in the lower Waikato, associated with the Waikato River mainly, uh, peat lakes, an unusual peat, uh, an unusual lake type found um, predominantly in the um, lower Waikato Waipa areas, uh, dune lakes on the coast, those associated with karst and volcanic landforms. As Greg just mentioned, shallow lakes are particularly vulnerable to deterioration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and they've obviously been subject to changes in hydrology, such as drainage, rerouting streams in and out of lakes, uh, removal of surrounding habitat and wetland drainage, uh, obviously the impact of invasive species, as well as uh, the inputs of nutrients, sediments, bacteria entering the lakes from surrounding land, settling on the bottom of these lakes and then being resuspended by wind uh, pest species. This makes shallow lakes particularly vulnerable to flipping, and by that I mean uh, changing from a clear water um, plant-dominated state to an algal-dominated turbid state. And it requires really specific and targeted approaches to try and change these or improve these, and that's very challenging. Uh, the next slide, please. So that was just the background. Um, the program itself uh, is broken up at restoration activities, um, and there are some key projects in there, and they are the Lake Whangapai project, which I'm going to spend most of the time talking about in this talk today. Um, next click, please. Um, Lake Kamahia, um, uh, one of the shovel-ready projects, and Apuatea Wetland, which is also one of the shovel-ready projects where we are uh, trying to get on top of the weeds and get some restoration planting involved there. The next part of the program is about sustaining and supporting collaborative relationships. Next click, please. And that's how, um, when I referred to about it being a collaborative approach with district councils, uh, Tangata Whenua, Department of Conservation, landowners and communities. We have a program as part of this, sorry, we have a section in this program um, about gathering uh, information to inform management. Uh, and I gave some examples of that in the paper. And we also have the lake level program if you could just click twice, please, um, that Greg referred to where we got some additional resources last year to make sure that we are um, managing the lake level um, program well enough. And you see in that picture there, that is one of the new uh, weirs that was put in at Lake Hotuananga uh, the year before last. I'm just going to spend some time now, uh, next slide please, to talk about the Lake Whangapai Restoration Project. Um, this was funded as, um, it's a multi year multi-party project um, funded through the Freshwater Improvement Fund that MFE um, put out a few years ago, but also has funding from the WRA, Department of Conservation, uh, the Council and landowners. Um, next click please. Um, it's a, the, there's five work streams in this project. Um, Dog focus on the fencing and environmental control. The lake is a large lake, there's a, over 20 kilometres of fencing that DOC have completed as part of this project to make sure that the entire lake margin is fenced. Um, we're responsible for the alligator weed control and catchment intervention uh, in the wider catchment, and Waikato Tainui are responsible for the kaitiaki monitoring framework. Um, are you happy to take questions? We can go, Natasha. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I wish we could... Um, if it's a generic question, wait till the end. Yeah, I'll wait till the end. Ed. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so Max got a specific one here. Um, so, if we look at this picture, and you look at that line there, you you talked about outcomes versus outputs. Talk to us about outputs and outcomes when you see that. What does what does that tell you when you look at that picture? Because it it tell it sends me. A really interesting message compared to what I see when I see that there. And, and what are you seeing up there in that bit? Well, I'm seeing um, quite a substantial accumulation of vegetation and looks like um, some swamp in here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Probably um, for the environment, a, a better deal than what I'm seeing here. A absolutely, yes. Um, I. It may be better to address that question at the end of the Whangapai okay. as I go through and just explain what we've done around the project. Um, sorry, as, as part of the project for that catchment interventions, making sure that we are providing that buffer. Um, 
uh, we are, um, DOC has been doing fencing and planting around the margin of the lake, but that's within the confines of um, people's farming land, own, land use. Um, Oh, you talked about our, you talked about outcomes and outputs. Yes. And you said it. Um, you can have a fence, but you might not get water quality. Are you asking us to believe that there might be some outputs that um, we get that are not directly related to improving water quality? I'm saying that it's a, a much bigger. Um, th th that things need to happen. All those things need to happen. Fencing, um, behavioural, oh, not behavioural change. Um, catchment management. It. Catchment purpose. management, yes. Yeah. Um, it needs to be done in a suite of things. Fencing is absolutely important, as is planting along the, the, the edges of lakes and wetlands and streams. Um, what I'm saying is, is that those long-term changes, deterioration, are going to take long-term whole of catchment uh, responses. Yeah, okay. It, it's just that when you bring up a subject of outcomes and outputs, yep. I smell a rat. Okay, because, well, let because me. That tells me that we're going down a path of we're going to do some stuff over here, which is an output because we've ticked the box because we've got to, uh, and we'll get to the water quality later. And, and yep. I don't want this council to be involved in any tick box activity where we get an output. And hopefully in the future we might get an outcome if we're lucky. That that sounds really loosey-goosey to me, and, and I hope that's not what you're suggesting. N not at all. And if I go through the slides, hopefully I can reassure you that the work that we've done as part of this project is to get to that point. That's the whole point of this project. Yeah, I think that's a bit hard because we, we know that things we do today might not give us a water quality improvement for 50 years. Now, Fred, specific to us, a couple of the, what you've seen today, or general? Yeah, well, being um, the constituent, one of the constituent councillors, and really um, apart from the very early part of uh, knowing this project was was on the books and objected to it, um, I'm interested to know a component of the 3.5 million at this stage of ratepayers' money. I know. Um, Waikato, you know, through Waikato River Authority, we match dollar for dollar. So I'm assuming it's probably as much, if not more, than Waikato River Authority's funding. I, I suspect it's a slightly different funding model for this particular project, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, yes, um, I, I can tell you, I can get you the exact figure breakdowns, but off the top of my head, the council has put in 200 and something thousand dollars into this project, and we have managed to and we spend as part of our work stream uh, over the life of the program about eight hundred and something thousand dollars. Eight hundred thousand for this yep. particular for the life for the life of the project. And the life of the project is um, five years. Next year is the last year. Next year's the next wow. financial year is the last year. Just following on, Stu, you know the, these lake uh, catchments, and I understand this is treaty and a lot of other things that um, are, you know want this work undertaken. Um, I'm looking at the outputs, the economic return in doing this work. Um, I know it's it, it's really pushing it uphill when we've got Canadian geese um, by the tens of thousands now. Um, carp, um, it's still being intensively fished for eels, mullet, etc. And of course, we're going to continue to get an ongoing decline in water quality regardless of how much planting and fencing is done. And that 200,000 that's being invested from ratepayers' money, I'm having a trouble. I, I, I couldn't get $50,000 to do catchment planning for the West Coast for three harbours. And there you get real economic return and an output. That's all I have to say. Thank you for letting me. Yes, Fred. OK, we'll keep rolling and thanks. Gotcha. Our next slide just shows um, what some of the lake shore looked like um, with 
full access of stock to the lake and then you can see oh, alligator yeah. weed there as well so I just wanted to put some of that in the context but I'm not going to talk about the alligator weed program I'm going to focus on the catchment intervention side of the project yeah. no, no, sorry point of order I'm going to say point of order why have you got that picture of a lifestyle blockers cows and a, a, a thing because that is offensive to me hang on. I, I mean it that, no, hang on. I'm sick of it I think it's just a generic picture. No, no, you. get rid of it then. Get rid of it. No. It's I'm a, not getting it. You know, no. As a council, we need to stop sending that bloody message out. It's just crap. So, so let's have a talk, but that, that's not Natasha's call. No, I'm, I'm not saying it's through a lease, but I really put that in there. It needs to go. I guess the photo's there to demonstrate. Not, no, hang on. It's not. Uh, it's I think there has been an improvement, and particularly Doc have now completed 20 kilometres of fencing of the lake edge, and that was to stop that kind of thing around the entire lake. No, no, come on, Stu, Greg. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to set context here because this is a lake under pressure, um, and there are a lot of issues within this catchment um, that, that needed to be managed. I think this is setting the example. Um, it's not to say this is the current state. There's obviously a lot of work that Natasha will go through um, of improvement, um, but I think it's important to understand the, the starting point this yeah, project as well. Right. It was the start of the project. You know, that, that was the issues we were dealing with. And, and mm. a lot of them are now to go on this front. Next slide. If, oh, if you're going to do that, because um, you could have predicted that that was going to happen, a before and after would have been helpful here, because it's a bit more affirmative. That, that is quite a negative image. Um, so. That's all you have to go. Not you. WRC, we send out messages like that. Okay. Yeah, before and after, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Let's keep rolling. Um, if you could just click all the points in this slide, I'm sorry that they're not all coming up at once. Um, the vision and strategy has um, a vision about swimming and gathering of Taonga species. And to put this project into context, the project goal amongst the partners was decided that there'd be no further deterioration in the water quality of Lake Whangapai. And that goal was decided as that was something that was achievable in the life of the project. And to measure that, to, to prove the work that we have done, or you know, to demonstrate whether the work that we were doing um, with the catchment intervention, um, the measure was to be measured was that the bacterial volumes would not exceed recreational guidelines more than 44% of the time. So that's holding the line is what it was at the start of the project. And so to do that, um, the project has focused on um, increasing the behaviours that will lead to improvements in water quality throughout the catchment. Next slide, please. So the first thing that we did, um, sorry, have I got the right slide? Yep. First thing that we, did, we identified, um, if you could just click all the links in this too, please, um, that nitrogen was the key contaminant driving the cyanerial, cyan driving the algal blooms, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, in the catchment. Um, and then the next piece of work that we did was to identify the sector contributing the most nitrogen loads to the Whangapai. And in this catchment, sheep and beef were contributing the most nitrogen. Uh, dairy was uh, about 27%, if you're interested. Um, we then identified the sector. Can I just ask what was the next one? Oh, I don't know if we know, are we? It wasn't covered as part of the report, but you have a point. That Canadian geese are a problem in this catchment, absolutely. Um, we then identified the sheep and beef farming practices that would ha that would have the most impact on nitrogen leaching into the waterways, and focused on how we can reduce that entering into the lake. Uh, next slide, please. And if you could make sure everything's up, and if you could just click the next slide to uh, next point, please. Um, we also looked at the types of activities that we could influ influence or change and then focused on the ones that we didn't already have programs of work supporting them. So the ones with the ticks are the ones where there are already pieces of work to support um, those actions happening. And so this has led to us, if you could click please, um, to focus on designing filtration wetlands, fencing and planting existing seeps and wetlands, uh, retiring land um, and afforestation, afforestation south facing and steep slopes. 
Um, and so if we could imagine, uh, if we can manage um, wetlands and south facing slopes, these things were the expected to have the most impact on uh, reducing the nitrogen, as well as the co-benefits of sediment and phosphorus, reducing those. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, we undertook a baseline uh, survey of how wetlands and south facing slopes were being managed before the project, and we plan to reevaluate that next year. And just to demonstrate some of the, the information that we got from that baseline survey, uh, the next slide shows that there is a large number of wetlands within the catchment, yeah. and, um, and that the average size is less than a hectare, and that most of them are unfenced. Um, and if we just click to the next slide, that shows it spatially. So you can see um, the outline of the catchment, uh, the lakes up in the top right hand corner. Um, we have the fenced wetlands are in the lilac colour, and you can see that they are mostly around the lake. We have some uh, large wetlands um, right beside the lake. Uh, the green colour is the partially fenced wetlands in the catchment and the unfenced catchments, which are mostly small, mostly there's you know, 0.92 hectare ones that are unfenced. So we've used, um, the next slide please. We've used a range of funding sources to um, help contribute to the catchment interventions on farm. Um, and next click please. And this slide, the picture on the right just shows um, most of the properties that we're working on at the moment. There are a couple more to add in there now. Um, so we're working right throughout the catchment uh, to impact, you know, to improve water quality in the lake. Next slide, please. I've just given three examples on this slide of the scale of the projects. Um, for example, the first one up there, there's been retirement and planting of wetland gullies. 21 hectares has been retired. Um, 4.6 Meters of fencing has been done and over 23,000 plants planted. Um, the Waik uh, Whangapai project has contributed $40,000 of that. Um, then there have been other funding such as from Wasit and landowners pay 50%. Uh, you can see at the in the Upper Myri ca um, catchment, another project has had two, and two hectares retired, almost a kilometre of fencing and 8,000 plants. So that's just an idea of the um, the scale of the projects that we've been working on with landowners. So just to summarise, um, the aim is, uh, next slide please, the aim has been to make, um, you know, the most difference and to focus on the activities will, that will um, ultimately lead to a better outcome for water quality in Lake Whangapai. Um, and we've also looked at what the barriers, barriers are to, to changing those um, farming practices. The project ends next financial year and we're currently exploring the next steps uh, to maintain the gains that we've made so far. Now the uh, graph on the right shows whether we have exceeded that 44% target as part of the project um, and you can see that we've um, exceeded it uh, 2021. 20, I think that was a 46% so we did exceed it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see after this dry summer we, how we went. There was an algal bloom early in the season, but disappeared before Christmas at Lake Whangapai. Um, final slide. Um, lake restoration is a really challenging um, area to work in. It involves many different players and does go beyond what an individual landowner or an individual agency can do. And I guess... I just wanted to emphasise that the scale of change required um, will require some hard decisions um, to make sure that you know we we actually do end up with our lakes being in a better condition than that they are now. Thank you very much. Hey, look, thanks, Natasha. Have you got anything else to add, Patrick? Now, look, that was a really good report. Really appreciate it, and um, it's a really good example of, um, in fact, it's probably one of our council's better examples of multi-stakeholder working together to get really good outputs. And Mac and I had first-hand experience with a Russian game guy that tried to kick us over Naroho, sort of use the state of Naroho for his own political I don't know, but um, it was really useful to have um, I think we had Kerry and a couple of scientists here from this team, which was really appreciated and pushing back on that. So so thanks for that. You know, Stu, you had a generic question, didn't you, at the beginning yep. that you didn't put here? Thank you, Natasha, for the report. Sorry, that stuff just really gets under my skin. I know, it's a fair point. Um, I mean, me alone, I spent, I was just adding up now, $52,000 on fencing my waterways and planting planting out things. So those photos of lifestyle as cattle 
and and because they're not a farm kettle, they're just big fat off a two acre block. So that really gets to me. So my apologies for uh, getting a bit up here on that. Um, these lakes, I just, I just, I, aren't they just sinkholes from mining activity? Like I'd love to jump, I'd love to jump back 150 years because Malcolm and all of them out there, like I said, those lakes never existed. That's the trouble. You're trying to clean up. They, they did in a, in a very smaller form, but a lot of them have expanded. Like um, definitely um, Kimiha, because that's um, the mining's directly under it, and I've seen photos of before. So, um, you know, are we actually going to achieve anything? Yeah, you know what I mean. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying it, it's yep. not um, a, great, just to clarify. a great project. I'm just yep. saying, are we actually going to get the outcomes? Yeah, and I guess that's what the Lake Whangapai project is all about: is can we demonstrate an improvement? Because um, it, it's an important lake. Um, it's still got some values. You know, it's not it's not one of our worst lakes, but it's still got values. And and can we achieve an improvement? Because it is expensive and it is hard. Um, just going back to your point on Kimahia, the Kimahia that you see on the from the motorway now is actually twenty percent of the original lake. So you, as you drive on the motorway north to Auckland, you are driving through former lake bed. And so that that lake is much, much reduced. The where the mine was on the on the left hand side of the motorway if you, as you're driving north, that was drained, that was part of the lake, that was drained, a big hole dug, coal taken out. That is now refilling as a as its um, remediation project. But also the wetland to the north of that was all part of the Kimihia Lake. Right. So it's a much, much larger lake than it is now. But is that Lincoln? Well, you've taken out the motorway, so we should take the motorway out, really, <laughs> and put the lake back in, because that's what would have linked it through the river, right? Eh? That's the problem that, is it's not getting the flushing. That, that is a big problem with our riverine lakes, is that yeah. for, for various reasons, whether it's flood control or roads or, or whatever, you know, development by, by people, has led to those connections between the lake and yeah, the rivers lost. being lost. And so, yes, you, you lose some of your flushing, you lose that ability of fish to go in and out of those lakes. Um, but we can't turn that to pre-humans, and, and I'm absolutely not advocating that. It's about making sure that we put things in place to make sure that the lakes are the best that they can be in, in, in an agricultural modified landscape. So when we're, when we're doing these things, um, in, in, in here, um, 16 on page 43, we've got twigs and feathers and, I mean, uh, forest and bird and um, fish and game. Um, what do they actually give us? What do they actually do? Because I know they rent the, the holes out for $1,000 a day in duck shooting to Aucklanders, but what do they actually return to us? What do they actually give to the local people, the ratepayers? How, what help do they give us? I think Other than we always seem to need to consult with them. I'm not sure why, but um, so we don't don't consult with landowners, but we do consult with, you know, regularly. I'm saying this, this project, I know you have consulted with landowners, but um, you know what I mean? It's like, what do they, what do Fish and Game actually do for us? I don't mean, I think that's something you have to ask Fish and Game. Yeah. But they are a, a statutory body um, set up under the Conservation Act. So they do have oh, okay. a, a role, you know, in a, in a statutory sense. They're also signatories to those, the Waikato District Memorandum of Agreement and the Waipa Peat Lakes and Accord. So along with um, Iwi Dock, the district councils and us, we've signed those agreements to work together to achieve where we can um, outcomes that we are all comfortable with to improve those lakes for whatever purpose, whether it's recreation or, or whatever. So yeah, I've just always wondered because they don't financially um, put anything into a project, but they seem to be as able to sit and, and think of but but they, they they must have a conflict of interest because they sell those ponds, like I say to Auckland, for a thousand dollars a day. Per person. Yeah, per I'm assuming you so, mean the ponds yeah, in Fungwari. And we get nothing back from that. Yeah, but, that is right. It is 100% right, I can show you. Yeah, I'll put you on the phone to Malcolm Lunsden tomorrow. He's got all the records. So I'm, I'm assuming those are the, the constructed wetlands in the Fungamarino. Yeah, yeah. That they, yeah. So that's, totally. they, they actually own that land. So I guess they can do that as yeah, landowners. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I guess, yeah. Yep, yeah. and my last one is. Um, when you're talking about Whangapai and the geese, um, yeah, Fred brought up the geese. So, uh, 
one goose um, produces one kilogram of nitrogen per day. One goose. Mm. So I I look over Thunder Bay and see the hundreds of thousands of geese and koi carp seething in there. Yet we go to beat up the farmer. Why is that? Why aren't we why are we overlooking the the absolute obvious a hundred thousand one kilo a day birds of nitrogen and going over here? Yet our pest plan totally missed them out. Koi and Canadian geese. So I'm interested how this council works. Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Um well, when I, I think Natasha um outlined that it's a, got to take an integrated approach. I'm asking the bigger question, Patrick. Yeah. I'm not asking on that particular project. So I'm asking so Natasha's view on what you know going forward, what what do you believe we should be doing? I mean I mean we're we're we you know, everywhere we go, we go into the farming sector and we're ignoring koi carp and, and Canadian geese. And that's how I see it. Um, I know we've got a beautiful report on here that we spend a lot of money on, but the actual money of getting rid of these pests is still to come, whether it's us, Doc, whoever it is. But I'm interested to know when are we going to actually address the great big fat elephant that's sitting in the room, that is these Canadian geese and koi carp, because they're the ones that are polluting our bloody waterways. They're the ones. I mean, we went to Eugenie Sage, and it was Eugenie Sage who said to me, not me, a thousand carp, a thousand koi carp, adult koi carp, is equivalent to have a hundred milking cows milking in the middle of the river. I think, can we so just, just Patrick's point, so I think we, we understand the problem definition you've made. Yeah, 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 I know, but I just, and you're probably not in a position to answer, but I just hope we start thinking about these well, things. I, th I think um, while no. we're looking at geese and koi are articulated in the decisions report that we put through to the RPMP review, which is you don't need rules for it, right? And I've said that numerous times in front of all of you. It's not a rule thing, so that's why they're not in the RPMP. And that, that we outlined that process for you. To me, it's a level of service issue, right? And we've talked about this at numerous LTPs around do we want to invest in this stuff or not? And, we, and we've put a small investment in for pest fish, and that's why we've got a report coming today for Canadian geese articulated in those reports what our current level of service is, and it's, it's, it's minuscule. But we offer some important advice, we're doing a little bit of research with some TAs, looking at the diet, and some things, but it's a small level of service. We I'm going to articulate it a little bit better. I'm going to articulate it a little bit better. The projects themselves are fantastic. Okay, I've seen them, they're brilliant, and you guys do a fantastic job. I really mean that. But there's a big elephant in the room. You know, we, we go to the farming sector thinking we're going to get gains out of there, especially sheep. There's, there's minimal gains to be had out of there, I, I would say, because they're so, so slightly stopped. So they're not like us pretty dairy farmers that haven't bought a fence. So it must, it must be in our minds these birds and fish are affecting our, well, you know, like, our great projects that we're doing. How do we get the outcomes for those pieces to work? Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, well, and, and I think then Natasha articulated it before that you need an integrated approach. There'd be no point just doing We've been saying that for nine years. We've been saying that for nine years. I've been sitting there. I don't think you're going to get your answer now, Joe. <laughs> I, I know, I know. You're, you're going to help me for making the media take your life. This is a good shape table for this discussion. <laughs> You've been here, but I've been here a bit longer, and yeah, I've been around the circle longer. a lot of times. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I okay. think there's one thing I would add to that, and that's about um, before we can. So, so for example, Koi do the resuspension of the sediments in the lake. Absolutely. Don't um, do that. They also contribute some of that, but they do resuspend what's already come into the lake over the last 150 years. And so, if we can stop what's coming into the lake before we're going to see. That, that's, a, that's something that we need to focus on as well. And so I think, as Patrick said, that integrated approach is really important. The koi carp and the geese and, you know, all the other pressures like that are the last, not, not the last, but, you know, the worst things to come at the end of that. 
and the lakes are less resilient to be able to cope with, you know, if we if we just had koi carp or if we just had geese, but that cum cumulative impact of pressures is really full on for lakes and, and particularly shallow lakes. Um, deep lakes are a little bit more resilient, um, but the shallow lakes warm up, koi stir it up, geese come in, absolutely, uh, and that does contribute to that water quality, ongoing water quality decline. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and I think actually some of the, the infrastructure review that Michelle's done will at least um, point to some places that point some places that we might be able to make a difference on because we can block off that core immigration in the future. So so we can do that. So I mean we we're making progress, but it's 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 inching. Yep. And that is the really hard thing. Yeah. I'm sure Michelle will explain. Michelle. Okay. Um, are you guys worried about your order? Thanks. No, no. Dennis, go. Yeah, thanks. Look, this is a wee bit out of left field, but um, Blair Dickey came to a climate action committee a few weeks back talking about the potential for renewable energy. One of the things he mentioned in that report. Dennis, can you put your thing a bit closer? Yeah. One of the things he mentioned in that um, report was the potential for having solar farms on shallow lakes. Um, and I know that they're being used on wastewater plants in Auckland. So it seems they may be economic. Um, so I'm just wondering whether there are any sort of co-benefits, ecosystem co-benefits from having panels on a lake that maybe provide more shading and that sort of thing. And is that something that's been considered? Uh, I think the main thing that was uh, highlighted in that report was about the shading. Um, I think that will come at a cost for wildlife, being able to access that open water. Um, so I guess that will be the trade-off that will have to be decided as if and when those projects proceed. Is that being actively sort of considered in any detail? Uh, not in ICN as part of the council. Right. Um, just for the record, um, the Canadian geese uh, adult male is 3.2 to 6.5, female is 2.5 to 5.5. They consume a cup of um, dry matter. They don't produce a kilogram of nitrogen. They may at best produce a kilogram of waste product, which will be made up of a whole range of things, some of which is nitrogen. But anyway, anyway, <coughs> that's... <laughs> okay, you guys thought that at lunchtime. So my, my question really follows on from Dennis's. Um, this, I, I can't help but feel being quite timid. Um, it, it just sort of feels like um, we've got a whole lot of reports and we're, and we're trying a whole lot of stuff, but none of it's a critical mass to be able to affect a sort of a really meaningful change. So my, so my question is, and we put the pressure through the CERC group recently on the chief executive's KPIs. And Councillor Quayle was strident in saying we should be driving innovation, using new technologies, etc. Um, and, and I just want to make sure that you guys, well, I'd, I'd want to get a sense from you of how empowered you are to um, be innovative and try new R&D projects. So, for example, um, Whangapai, can we use weed mats? Because somewhere in this report you talk about the lakes are in a eutrophic state. So it strikes me that if we could find weed rafts that would suck the nutrients out of it, we'd reduce the degree of eutrophic um, state of the lake. And so um, instead of trying to find answers for you, I, I just want to get comfort, Chair, that these our executive, because uh, um, I saw NEWA sign up there, I just want to get comfort that they're using all their possible networks and all their creative imagination to try things. I think we should try the solar rafts. I think we should try um, grass rafts. Try these things and see how they go. Um, or are you saying to us, no, look, funds are tight, haven't really got much innovation uh, opportunities and r and is difficult. Where, where are we at on that spectrum? Sure. That's the second, the, second, uh, the yeah. first question. The second question is... Oh, gosh. Just one. <laughs> we, we hold on, hold on. The second one on the yeah. the first one. <laughs> um, so it is a really good question. Um, I've got two 
um, two responses, so make sure I cover both of them. Um, the Lake Whangapai project was that, you know, can we, a multi-agency, multi-year, multi-approach project achieve that? So I think that has been a big step forward for us to work in true collaboration in that sense. Um, in terms of uh, the research and development and innovative um, things we are trying, um, I didn't talk about them at length, but they are in the paper. Um, we are partnering with NIWA for Rototurf, which is trying to get macrophytes re-established um, in the lakes. Um, that has some, they're going to try a coconut hessian mat with impregnated with seeds to get them to go to, to grow. Trouble is koi carp, catfish, stir up that bottom. So getting them re-established so, um, is really hard. And of course, if we've then got algal blooms, we get extra shading and that causes the collapse. You know, we get in this downward spiral. So I guess the fungal project is about reducing that load of cyanobacterial so that we can create conditions for that kind of thing to happen. So yes, we do partner with research agencies like NIWA to look at that innovative um, work. Um, the other project that's just finished this financial year has been a project on harnessing the biofiltration of freshwater mussels in Lake Ohiniwai um, because they filter out things like algae, um, whether we can enhance the use of freshwater mussels, which have been at decline in these lakes for a whole lot of reasons, um, but to try and boost that biofiltration to help try and keep that water quality clear. So I guess, yes, we are trying to invest in those innovative techniques. I think the Whangapai project has allowed us to work at that scale that is required, that whole of catchment scale. Um, but we have to do that at our over 300 lakes in the region. You know, that, that's the, the scale of the, the pro project uh, program that would be required. Well, Chair, uh, I mean, <clears throat> to me, Instead of spending a little bit across 300 lakes, you should throw all the resource into one lake and let's get a proof of concept. Because once once we've got a proof of concept, we can roll that out across the other 300 lakes. But if you're nickel and diming R&D across 300 lakes, we're going to be here in 25 years. And please and be assured that we do prioritise and exactly why we invested in the Lake Fung Pay catchment. Last question is, is our cyanobacteria the only agent that causes these lakes to flip? Are there other viruses, protozoas, whatever? Uh, look, I think the, the cyanobacterial blooms are a result of a complex um, food web interaction between zooplankton, fish, and so it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it manifests as an algal bloom. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jude. Cool. So I've got Tupper and then you, Fred. So Tupper, you're there on one? Kilda. I'd just like to um, thank staff for the progress in final pay and the report. Note to councillors that this is a report where we received that Glenn Murray in person and we had issues with the sign off, but we're asking the same questions now. So I invite all councillors to read the restoration strategy because that's what we prioritised in the catchment, the River Authority, and the only reason it's happening is because there's an extra funder in town. So the last 10 years' gains have been a direct result of the, the settlement. It's not because we've spent all rate, rate, rate it's been the best spend of rate payer buck in the catchment. So just note that in the minutes. Kia ora. Uh, thank you. Took the points well, mate. Uh, Fred. Yeah, um, I'm going to uh, upset Tipper because, uh, you know, that 200000 that is used to rate payers' money on the West Coast, um, in my opinion, could have been spent better, but because of the partnerships and the good work that is happening, I agree because with... Because of the extra money in the catchment, that's basically it. There's no new money in, in the West Coast catchment, a, a big philanthropic trust like the River Authority, just, just stating the facts. Kia ora. Yeah, and as Andrew pointed out, putting that investment into one to roll out onto the other lakes is, is a great thing. I went to Whangapai when it was first started, and um, could see all the different issues that were there, were, that were in front of us. Um, and sorry, Tippy, you just chucked me off completely what I was oh, going yes. about. But, um, oh yeah, it was actually, um, I noticed in the slide it said destocking. Uh, okay, so that's destocking um, rates for sheep and beef within the catchment. Yeah, I've, Again, um, you know, that's that's a pretty harsh thing on landowners when we have got overstocking rates of geese, you know, 
and I'm going to rave on about the geese thing because um, if we're looking at destocking farmers, uh, you know, that's our economy suffering. That's them that's going to suffer. And yet we're turning a blind eye to the elephant in the room. Um, before destocking, I would I would be supporting the removal of the geese, um, and then look at other options. And of course, the other things that I think should be considered in that catchment is a moratorium on eeling fishing. It is the eel that actually eats and and um, eats all the young carp. By removing that, uh, you know, the, the predator, we're exasperating the problem. Um, when it comes to your, your mussels um, and your weed mat, whilst we have carp and geese in those numbers, it, it's, it's just, again, um, I think throwing money in a hole without, without actually having that good income. But if there are small trials, where um, you hopefully will be able to prove me wrong, well, then I think that's great. But I'll go back to um, what tippers can tip in the treaty party, party settlement, that's fine. Um, you know, if that's entirely treaty settlement money, but if it's dipping into ratepayers' purse from our ICM targeted rate, uh, I would expect and represent a better return, both economically and for biodiversity reasons, than putting it into that particular or those lakes. We have three harbours that absolutely provide kaimawana, that feed families, increase biodiversity values, and we've got one harbour that's been given a B grading because it doesn't have those biodiversity values that this council seems to uh, think it requires. So there's a hell of a lot of work that needs to be done. We we're really going to get a bang for our buck. And it's not that. Thank you. Uh, and we'll deal with that um, harbour stuff next week at our workshop or whenever it is. Uh, do you want me just to re respond well, about if, the if you've destocking? Got some value add, yeah, uh, just one point of clarification. If the project hasn't looked at destocking, but that was one, a list of things that could be done. So just to clarify that that wasn't part of our programme. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sure. Can I just um, make one point? Um, that the, the money that council puts in is um, a lot of it, it's covered across a number of programs, but a lot of it's um, like, you know, kind of business as usual. But you know, the alligator weed program, hey, we, we go where the alligator weed is, so um, that won't, that investment wouldn't change whether this project is going big or small. The <coughs> alligator weed program is what it is, so yeah, no, that's cool. Thanks, Fred. Hey, um, Tipper, if your hand's still up, are you sorted or have you got another question? Oh, no, just to note that Rotorua Lakes are using um, uh, Mata Ranga Māori to do weed matting, so we can learn from other examples on that. Um, noting that Tangapai and Waikare are the only lakes that have, um, have big uh, projects with the WRA on them. There's been smaller opportunities in Northern Lakes, but um, Councillor Nebone would know that it's either hurry up and wait for the rest of the catchment to be clean, or the tribe that's most affected by the residual massive waste in the river, waiting another 100 years for it to be resolved. So again, Councillor Chuak, we're not in competition with uh, the West Coast. It's also in my tribal interest. We're trying to seek other opportunities there too. So kia ora. Kia ora tapa. Um, I see Natasha nodding, so sort of. Hey, look, thank you very much, Natasha. Um, really appreciate your time today and your um, informative presentation. So, um, no more questions. We'll um, need a mover and second to put that report. So, Mac and Dennis, um, otherwise in favour, please say aye against Terry. Hey, we're just going to break for five minutes, please, and then we'll be back. Yeah, thank you. Dennis, turn